Come on, hurry up. Okay, I seem to have hooked up everything else, and uh, I see there's already some folks on and saying hello, hello Petra, hello Patrick, and guten Morgen, uh, guten Morgen von Amerika, um, I can't remember if it's fun or auf, no, anyway, doesn't matter, um, hello, hello. Anyway, I, I, so yes, here we are. It is 2 o'clock in the morning, my time, actually 2.01, um, and I'm going to be reading tonight very soon. I have some few comments to make about that before I begin, but before I start doing that, um, I should mention what else, whatever other things. Oh, Boris, you flattering dog, you, and hello to you too, and Neil. Um, it actually is a reflection off my screen. Ah, does look like, uh, like I've been, um, taking melange. Um, so anyway, Boris, Chris, Neil, everybody, um, good morning. And here's what's going on. First off, no particular news to report from, uh, Casa Williams Beal, or Beal Williams. Uh, we are still hunkered down. Um, as far as I know, everybody's still healthy. We're doing the stuff, um, doing the things, doing what we're supposed to. I, I hope you guys are all hunkered down too and taking good care of yourselves. And, hmm, anything else I need to mention? No, everybody's, everybody's alive. All the dogs are just as annoying. The cat is just as complacent. The Young people in the household are just as young as they were. Well, you know, uh, slightly older, but basically just the same. Uh, Deb and I are staggering on through daily life, uh, working and paying taxes and doing all that stuff. So we're okay too, and I uh, hope the same can be said for you. Um, what I'm going to do, and here is my announcement um, God, I can't, I'm not even certain at this point how long we've been doing this little experiment um, where I've been reading. Um, I've been reading on Sunday nights, my time, Sunday evenings, um, for at least three months now, um, every week. And I've been uh, reading on Sunday early morning, my time, this, this particular slot here for almost that long. Um, but I think for the first time, I am going to initiate a, uh, some change because, um, as I think I mentioned before, I'm running out of things to read and I haven't uh, decided yet what I want to do long term. So what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is I am going to start reading from my very first book, which is called Tail Chaser Song. It has this attractive cat on the cover, painting that uh, this cover is, this cover painting is by Brault Brault, who I believe is a Danish artist, and it's a beautiful cover. The original hardcover was, um, painting was by Michael Emden. Um, but this is Brault Brault, and this, is, this cover has become the best known one. Um, anyway, so, but because it's a long book, and because it's gonna take me a while to read, and because it doesn't seem fair to read an entire novel to one slot, of the two slots I'm reading, um, again, two in the morning, seven in the evening. What I'm going to do from now on for at least a couple of months or however long it takes to read this, I am going to be reading like a section early in the morning, like this slot, and then I'm going to read the next section at 7 p.m. the next day. So, 
if you want the entire story. It doesn't mean you have to tune in for both of them, although that's obviously a way you can do it also for those who are in the right time zones where you can manage both. But remember, every single one gets recorded and it's here. So if you are going to say listen tonight to whatever it turns out to be, introduction, chapter one, etc., and then you are going to wait until the same time next week to hear the reading. You will miss a piece unless you go and listen to the recorded version. That's all because otherwise I either have to read the same thing to both things, which doesn't really work too well because there's a lot of overlap between the two. Um, or uh, either that or I would have to um, just read Tail Chaser Song to one of the groups and not to the other group. Um, because it's not all overlap. There's a lot of people who are only in one or only in the other. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start reading Tell Chaser's Song tonight and tell you a few tales about the, the origin of the book and hence the origin of my writing career, uh, speckled and checkered as it is. And um, then I'm going to, whatever I, wherever I stop tonight, I'm going to start again tomorrow at 7 p.m. my time. And I'm going to continue on like that, alternating um, a section with each broadcast until I finish the book. So if you do want to see the part that isn't in your normal time slot that you tune in to TV TAD, um, they will be here. I think they're also on YouTube, but they're, they will also be here on my website available. You can, not my website, my Facebook page where you can, I think my Facebook page is open to everybody. So if there's a problem with that, let me know. But as far as I know, they are available. And if you scroll back far enough, you can find any of the earlier ones I did. But so you certainly won't have too much problem scrolling back a few days to find the next segment that you will want to know to stay current with the story as the twists and turns and the excitement builds and the hackles on your neck rises and your tail begins to twitch from side to side. Wait, no, that's cats. Sorry. Anyway, so that's what's going to happen. Don't freak out on me. We may change the plan over the long term, but for, for the short term, that is my plan. And so tonight I'm going to start reading Tell Chaser's Song. Now, for those of you who um, are not aware, as I said, of my entire publishing history, uh, Tell Chaser's Song was the first book that I ever sold. Um, it was also the first book I ever wrote, which uh, I, I wrote one really bad, maybe two really bad screenplays, one of which was because a friend asked me to help, and um, it's actually somebody I worked with at KSJO, local radio station, Ton Mastery, lovely, lovely woman, um, and she was trying to do a horror film, and she said, you seem like the type who might write something, you know, and so I wrote a script for that. I don't think anything ever came of that. But then I wrote another script, which, uh, as I've mentioned in the past, it was called The Sad Machines. And the main character, whose name was, wait for it, Ishmael, Ishmael Parks, uh, the main character was kind of a developmental version, early version of Simon. In other words, sort of gormless and learned things as he went through the story. But that's the only things I'd written. And then I set out at one point um, to try and write a book. And that in and of itself is a story, but I don't remember how much of that's in the introduction, and I am going to read the introduction. So there you go. Um, so anyway, but the, I think, does this mention any dates? Any dates in it at all? Probably not, but um, so 1985 was when this book was first published. So I know that's before a lot of you were even born. That kind of crap sneaks up. <laughs> you may be thinking now, geez, that's a long time ago. Geez, he's really old. Yeah, I started out like you. It, you know, it's it's like a downhill toboggan ride, life is. By the time it's really going, you can't get off. Uh, well, I guess you could if you really wanted to, but uh, it, 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 whatever. Anyway, so. Reading from Tell Chaser Song. Now, this is actually the 15th anniversary edition. So this came out in 2000. Now, we're already in 2020. So this was the 15th anniversary edition. I am proud to say that this book has always been in print. Um, and uh, a lot of people read it in their school years, which is 
charming to me. Um, anyway, so I am going to read to you. I think I'm going to read without my glasses on. I think it'll be easier. Um, yeah, that'll happen to you too. Don't get cocky. So, Tell Chaser song, 1985. And um, the book is uh, dedicated to my grandmothers, Elizabeth D. Anderson and Elizabeth Evans, whose support has meant so much, and to the memory of Fever, who was a good friend, but a better cat. And that is the dedication. So here is the introduction that was written especially for the 15th anniversary edition. Again, a long time ago now, but at the time it seemed like a long time since the book had come out. And it's titled, How Much Is That in Cat Years? Some thoughts by the author. It's easier for me to remember where I was during the time I wrote Tail Chaser Song than it is for me to remember who I was. And it's not all that easy to remember the where part, actually. Personal archaeology tells me that at least when I started the book, somewhere in 1981, I must still have been living in that apartment in Menlo Park, California. It was a fourplex, and one of the three neighbors sharing the building was the writer Ron Hansen, who was then teaching at Stanford. I mention it only because Ron has written several fine books. They are fine books. Um, he also had one of his books made into a movie called The Assassination of... Uh, Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford, uh, which had Brad Pitt and a bunch of other people in it. It was quite good, and the book was very good. Um, anyway, I mention it only because Ron has written several fine books, and the fact that two people who would eventually reach the New York Times bestseller list were living in the same fourplex amuses me. It also makes me want to track down my other two neighbors from the building and ask them where the hell their manuscripts are and why are they slacking off. The apartment was significant for one other reason. It was the first place I ever lived with cats. I'd always been what is referred to as a dog person, which should mean that you scratch yourself in public and howl at the moon, but actually seems to mean that you like dogs. But my now ex-wife had cats, so when we moved in together, I did too. Now, many of my friends and readers and people who've come to my readings have heard me address this matter before this next bit. So, you know, even then it was an old question I used to get. It took me a long time to understand the cat-human bargain. The dog-human bargain was always pretty obvious. One, human feeds and shelters dog. Two, dog worships human. Three, repeat daily. The cat thing, however, was a bit more oblique. As far as I could tell, it seemed to go something like this. One, human feeds cat. Two, cat looks at human as though cat has never seen human before. Three, repeat daily. Thus, I suppose it's understandable that I began to think about cats and how they think, and after a while, how they might see the world. It became a sort of a private game, inventing cat mythologies, cat folklore, clever little cat in-jokes. And for the first couple of years that I lived as a human domesticated by cats, it pretty much stayed that way, just a bit of mental knitting with which to amuse myself. As I said at the beginning, I can remember where I was better than who I was. I was still in my horrible jobs phase, I know that. I know because that phase lasted from my last year of high school until I became a full-time writer in 1990, so it covers the majority of my adult life. Well, it was the majority of my adult life at that point. So it covers the majority of my adult life, which included many of the kinds of occupations mostly held by people who show up on the news for firebombing a neighbor's house. We thought it was a little strange that he sold shoes, but he seemed like a not normal guy other than that. At the beginning of the Tail Chasers song experiment, I think I was still waiting tables in one of the world's least busy restaurants, a little place called La Cigal off the El Camino Real south of San Francisco. It means the cricket. I have no idea why it was named that. It was a French restaurant owned and operated by Thai people. T-H-I, Thai people. Very nice people, very good cooks, but perhaps not the world's best business folk. All I remember for certain is that whole nights would go by without customers. The chef, a large mustached man named Johnny, never did figure out that my name was Tad rather than Ted. So he would follow me around the place in our copious free time doing his best Elvis imitation as he sang, A Baby Let Me Be Your Little Teddy Bear. 
and he would sing it like this. Baby, let me be your little teddy bear. Um, his heavy tie accent turned Teddy into Terry, which made it even stranger. Somewhere around this time, I was also working as the graveyard shift operator for an answering service, fielding calls from distraught psychiatric patients. I'd forgotten about that. On occasion, when their shrinks had tired of them and refused to answer any more of their calls, I would bravely take on the therapeutic role myself, since most of them just desperately wanted to talk to someone, anyone, even an impoverished waiter. If the AMA, if the, AMA the American Medical Association, is reading this, however, I will deny everything in court, so don't bother with the lawyers. In any case, I don't think I did any worse for these poor suffering people than their therapists did. On occasion, I would tell them about my work history, which seemed to make some of them feel better about their own lives. While I was selling shoes, drawing soldiers' hands, forget it, it's a long story, peddling insurance, throwing newspapers, stacking tiles, I was always doing something more or less artistic on the side. I was in a band for a long time, I did theater, I worked as a cartoonist and illustrator, and I did a radio talk show for the entire decade of the 80s. But none of these things made any money to speak of, and I began to wonder if I was finally going to have to go to college and get a real job. Not the sort of thing I'm suited for, I'm afraid. I'm allergic to business suits, for one thing, and I can't get up in the morning without a major electrical shock of some kind. Also, stupid people trying to manage me sends me into acute depression. So, I decided that it was time to find some other artistic thing at which not to make money. I'm surprised that it took me so long to get around to writing. I came from one of the most bookish families you'll ever see, and reading has always been one of the most important parts of my life. I'd written bits and pieces here and there throughout my life. Some journalism in school, song lyrics, parodies of various things to amuse my friends, but I never seriously considered trying it for real. I'm not quite sure what made me change my mind, except perhaps the glum prospect of having Johnny the Chef following me around for another decade, singing that damned song. The first thing I'll actually mention in here, the first thing I wrote was a not-too-good science fiction film script called The Sad Machines. I still think the title was okay, and the protagonist was sort of an early model for Simon from my Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn books, but otherwise it's just as well I never tried to sell it to anyone, or even show it to anyone, not bound by ties of love and kinship. I decided I was ready to write a novel. Why I thought so, I have no idea, but I suppose the word chutzpah figures in there somewhere, and the cat concepts I'd been playing around with seemed like a fun place to start. I'd grown up on animal stories and fantasy fiction, so it didn't seem too far from what I knew. Later on, many people told me how clever I was to write about cats, so popular with a fantasy reading crowd. But I can honestly say that I never thought of that. It was just proximity. If my ex-wife had kept armadillos, I probably would have wound up writing Truck Dodgers song or something. I wrote at least the first half of the book on a cursive typewriter. Yes, it looked funny, but it beat the hell out of handwriting, laboring at night on the kitchen table after the various other jobs were done. I usually had more than one. I'm not sure how long it took me to write the book altogether, but it must have been about two years. I tried to bring real cat behavior into it, but it was also very much a fantasy novel. There are even a couple of Lord of the Rings jokes, like the audience with Queen Sunback, a glancing parody of the Hobbits meeting Galadriel. When I finished, I didn't do anything with it for some time, not because I thought it was bad, but simply because I wasn't really sure what I was supposed to do next. Writing a book on the kitchen table was kind of like going out jogging in the evenings. Trying to sell it suddenly seemed like entering the Olympic trials. At last, I made a list of publishers who were doing fantasy novels and sent it to the first name. They sent it back so quickly that I'm pretty sure when I got it back, I was still waving to the mailman who'd taken the manuscript away in the first place. The gist of their refusal was that they didn't do, quote, talking animal books, although they'd make an exception for, potential, for a potential bestseller, which mine, they gently informed me, clearly wasn't. They were actually nice people, so except for the time I drove by their corporate offices and tossed a publisher's weekly bestseller list through their window, it was coincidentally tied to a large brick. I have never gloated or mocked them for their tactical error. And in actuality, it was a lucky break for me because I wound up with Daw Books, who you can see is still printing copy copies of the book many years later. See, there's the Daw logo right on there. 
who, as you can see, <laughs> who, as you can see from the label, where did I go? Um, is still printing copies of the book many years later and presumably selling them too, or else they're going through a very expensive charade for the sake of my self-esteem. The day that the We Want to Buy Your Book letter came in January of 1985 is one of those things you never forget, right up there with weddings and the birth of children. The letter itself, signed by company founder and some science fiction legend Donald Walheim, is framed and hanging on the office wall across from me as I write this introduction. I was on my way out to walk my dog Gala, who was then a youthful post-pup of about two and a half years. Strolling in the hills above Stanford after getting that letter was like getting a dose of some fabulous but gentle drug, like a big breath of pure oxygen. My life was finally going the way I wanted it to. I had long since left the French restaurant behind, while well, it had unceremoniously closed, but I was still doing the same kinds of jobs, so the prospect of doing something I really liked for a living was a heady one. Fortunately, I had no idea how stunningly unusual it is to make a living writing fiction, or I might have been a little less joyful. But perhaps my ignorance actually helped me toward being a full-time writer, one of those the bumblebee doesn't know it can't fly things. I remember events, times, things better than I remember, remember the feelings. I remember that neither of the two cats who had fascinated me in my maiden sharing with cats experience were still around when the novel was published. A sexually ambivalent cat named Mishka, who I only found out later was male, had run away from that apartment before the book was finished. Fever, our beloved orange Tom, to whom the book is in part dedicated, had died a couple of years earlier, one of the last generation of cats to get lymphoma before they could vaccinate for it. His last afternoon alive, when his strength was failing and we had agreed to take him to the vet for the final shot the next day, he scratched feebly to be let out, although he had not been outside the house for days. He staggered into the front yard and sniffed a dandelion, then walked with unsteady dignity back into the house. He died that night at home and on his own terms. Time passes and people are as mortal as cats if longer lived. I also dedicated the book to my two grandmothers. My mom's mother, Elizabeth Anderson, only lasted a bit beyond the publication of the book. She was in her early 90s and had been through several strokes. I don't think she was holding on to life very hard in the end. I miss her very much. More than anyone else, I wish I could show her how lucky I've been with my writing, what it's brought me and where it's taken me. She was always very proud of me, always expected great things. I don't know that I have done anything great, but I know that my grandmother would think so, and would even if I were still throwing newspapers. That's what grandmothers do. My dad's mother, Elizabeth Evans, died a little over a year ago. That was in 1999. This was written in 2000. She made it to 99. We should all be so lucky, and was very, very proud of the dedication and Tail Chaser song. She acquired several copies and made sure at least one of them was in her retirement home's library at all times, where she could point out the dedication to everyone, more than once to some, I'm sure. She lived long enough to see the birth of our first child and told my wife Deborah and I many times that even though our little son could barely stand up yet, he was, quote, a true wonder, or as she said it, would have said it, a true wonder, because she was from Memphis. Um, and just as clever as can be, and that, I suppose, is what great-grandmothers do. Even Gala, the young golden retriever I was walking on the day I got the letter offering to buy Tail Chaser Song, has gone now. In her own way, she was just as long-lived as my grandmother, succumbing at last at the splendidly old, and to be honest, largely immobile and highly flatulent age of 17 and a half. As my British friends would say, she had a good innings. I can remember all sorts of things and people from when I wrote the book, but as I said at the start of this, I'm not sure I can remember me. Much of the past is frozen for us, which is why it's often such a shock to go back and visit remembered places or meet old acquaintances. It seems almost treacherous that they should have changed when we were looking the other way. But our own selves are like pearls created by layer after layer of present, laid over past until the original thing is completely hidden. Yes, I realize that I'm likening myself to hardened oyster spit. I never claimed to be a sentimentalist. 
I do know that I will never, as long as I live, get over the strangeness of seeing copies of Tail Chaser's song in languages I will never learn to speak, sent from countries I may never get to visit. Uh, although I should insert here in the 2020 parenthesis, I've actually gotten to visit a lot of those countries since then. Not all of them, but quite a few, which has been wonderful. It's not so disconcerting with my later books. This older me is a bit more jaded about the marvels of my life. But somehow with my first book, The Wonder Remains. To think that the little imaginary cat who came into being on my kitchen table in that apartment has been so many places, met so many people. And through him, I have met so many people myself, both directly and indirectly. It's quite marvelous, really. For most people, what their cat gets up to only brings them into contact with the neighbors on either side. The fact is, even when I read the book, I can't remember the person who wrote it. Not really. I can remember what he did, some of the things he thought, but I can't really remember what it felt like to be him. Which is the fascinating thing about books, as opposed to authors. That me is gone, but the book he wrote is still around. That's worth celebrating, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you for coming to meet me and my imaginary cat. Thanks for helping the person I was then become a generally very happy older version of himself. It could have been a lot worse. If you're about to read this book for the first time, I hope you enjoy it. I did, and I do. Signed, me, April 12th, 2000. Now, before I start actually reading the book, I should mention to you that there are poems at the beginning of each chapter. Most of them are extremely short. The one that starts the book out is long, but I'm going to read it anyway in the interest of giving you the whole thing. Um, and this is a poem that was written by Christopher Smart in, I believe, the 16th century? I'd have to go back and check that. For I will, this is called uh, something about my cat, Jeffrey, and I don't, I've forgotten the title now. Jeffrey spelled J-E-F-F-R-Y. So this guy, many hundreds of years ago, wrote this poem about his cat. Christopher Smart was a really interesting character, by the way, and worth looking up himself. He had a very strange, odd life. For I will consider my cat. For at the first glance of the glory of God in the East, he worships in his way. For this is done by wreathing his body seven times around with elegant quickness. For having done duty and received blessing, he begins to consider himself. For this he performs in ten degrees. For first he looks upon his forepaws to see if they are clean. For secondly, he kicks up behind to clear away there. For thirdly, he works it upon the stretch with the forepaws extended. For fourthly, he sharpens his paws by wood. For fifthly, he washes himself. For sixthly, he rolls upon wash. For seventhly, he flees himself. That's F-L-E-A-S. He flees himself that he may not be interrupted on the beat. For eighthly, he rubs himself against a post. For ninthly, he looks up for his instructions. For tenthly, he goes in quest of food. For when his day's work is done, his business more properly begins. For he keeps the Lord's watch in the night against the adversary. For he counteracts the powers of darkness by his electrical skin and glaring eyes. For he counteracts the devil who is death by brisking about the life. For in his morning horizons, he loves the sun, and the sun loves him. For he is of the tribe of Tiger. For the cherub cat is a term of the angel Tiger. For there is nothing sweeter than his peace when at rest. For there is nothing brisker than his life when in motion. For God has blessed him in the variety of his movements. For he can tread to all the measures upon the music. Introduction. In the hour before time began, Mirslar Allmother came out of the darkness to the cold earth. She was black and as furry as all the world come together to be fur. Mirslar banished the eternal night 
and brought forth the two. Harar golden eye had eyes as hot and bright as the sun at the hour of smaller shadows. He was the color of daytime and courage and dancing. Fela Sky Dancer, his mate, was beautiful, like freedom and clouds and the song of travelers returned. Golden Eye and Sky Dancer bore many children and raised them in the forest that covered the world at the beginnings of the elder days. Climb fast, wolf friend, tree singer and bright nail. Their young were strong of tooth, sharp of eye, light of foot and straight and brave to their tail end. But most strange and beautiful of all the countless children of Harar and Fela were the three firstborn. The eldest of the firstborn was Viror White Wind. He was the color of sunlight on snow and of swiftness. The middle child was Grizraz Heart Eater, as gray as shadows and full of strangeness. Thirdborn was Tangalur Firefoot, he was as black as Mirslar Allmother, but his paws were red like flame. He walked alone and sang to himself. There was rivalry among the firstborn brothers. White Wind was as fast and strong as a cat could dream of being. None could overmatch him at jumping and running. Firefoot, foot, Firefoot was as clever as time. He solved all puzzles and riddles and made songs that the, that the folk sang for generations. Heart Eater could not match his brother's exploits. He grew jealous and began to plot the downfall of White Wind and the humiliation of the folk. So it came to pass that Heart Eater raised up a great beast against the, fo against the folk. Tomalkum was its name, and it was the last spawn of the demon hound Venris, whom Mirslar had destroyed in the days of fire. Tomalkum, raised and nurtured with Heart Eater's hatred, slew many folk before it was itself slain by the gallant White Wind. But Viror White Wind received such wounds that he soon wasted and died. Seeing the downfall of his schemes, Heart Eater was afraid and crept down a hole and disappeared into the secretive earth. There was great lamentation in the court of Harar at the death of White Wind, the best beloved. Firefoot, his brother, fled the court in heartache, renouncing his claim to the mantle of kingship and wandered the world. Fela Sky Dancer, White Wind's mother, was ever after silent all her long life. But Harar Goldeneye was so full of rage that he wept and swore great oaths. He went howling into the wilderness, destroying all before him in his search for the traitorous heart eater. Finally, unable to bear such great pain, he fled to the bosom of the All Mother in the sky. There he still lives, chasing the bright mouse of the sun across the heavens. Often he looks down to earth below, hoping to see Viror running once more beneath the trees of the world forest. Countless seasons turned, and the world grew older before Firefoot again met his treacherous brother, Heart Eater. In the days of Prince Clean Whisker, in the reign of Queen Morning Stripe, Lord Tangalore came to the assistance of the Ruhue, the owl folk. A mysterious creature had been pillaging their nests and had killed all the Ruhu hunters who had come against it. Firefoot laid a trap, clawing away at a mighty tree until it was near cut through, then lay in wait for the marauder. When the creature came that night and Firefoot felled, felled the tree, he was astonished to discover that beneath it he had trapped Grizraz Heart Eater. Heart Eater begged Firefoot to free him, promising that he would share the ancient lore that he had discovered beneath the ground. Lord Tangalur only laughed. When the sun came up, Heart Eater began to scream. He writhed and screeched so that Firefoot, although fearing a trick, liberated his suffering brother from beneath the pinioning tree. Heart Eater had been so long beneath the earth that the sun was blinding him. He clawed and rubbed at his steaming eyes, howling so piteously that Firefoot looked about for a way to protect him from the burning of the day star. 
But when he turned away, the blinded heart eater dug himself a tunnel more swiftly than any badger or mole. By the time the startled firefoot bounded over, heart eater had disappeared back into the belly of the world. It is told that he still lives there, hidden from the eyes of the folk, that he works foul deeds underground and aches to return to the world above. Part one. Chapter one, and this little bit is the poem. Make no mistake, we are not shy. We're very wide awake, the moon and I. W.S. Gilbert from the Mikado, by the way. The hour of unfolding dark had begun and the rooftop where Tail Chaser lay was smothered in shadow. He was deep in a dream of leaping and flying when he felt an unusual tingling in his whiskers. Fritty Tail Chaser, hunter child of the folk, came suddenly awake and sniffed the air. Ears pricked and whiskers flared straight, he sifted the evening breeze. Nothing unusual. Then what had awakened him? Pondering, he splayed his claws and began a spine-limbering stretch that finally ended at the tip of his reddish tail. By the time he had finished grooming, the sense of danger was gone. Perhaps it had been a night bird passing overhead or a dog in the field beneath. Perhaps, perhaps I am becoming a kitten again, Freddy thought to himself who bolts in fright from falling leaves. The wind ruffled his newly groomed fur. Peaked, he leaped down from the roof into the tall grasses below. First, he must attend to hunger. Later, it would be time to go to the meeting wall. Unfolding dark was waning, and Tail Chaser's belly was still empty. His luck had not been dancing. He had held motionless, patient watch at the entrance to a gopher hole. When an eternity of near-silent breathing had passed and the inhabitant of the burrow had still not presented himself, Tail Chaser had given up in frustration. After pawing in annoyance at the hole mouth, he had gone in search of other game. Luck had been completely absent. Even a moth had eluded his pouncing attack to fly spiraling up into the darkness. If I can't catch something soon, he worried, I shall have to go back and eat from that bowl that the big ones put out for me. Hurrah! What kind of hunter am I? A faint wisp of scent brought Tail Chaser to an abrupt halt. Absolutely motionless, all senses straining, he crouched and sniffed. It was a squeaker, downwind and very close. He moved as delicately as a shadow, carefully picking his way through the undergrowth, then froze again. There! A jump and a half before him sat the mraiaz he had scented. It squatted, unaware of Tail Chaser, and pushed seeds into its cheek, nose twitching nervously, eyes rapidly blinking. Freddy lowered himself to the ground, his upraised tail lashing back and forth behind him. Hunkered, he drew himself up on his hind legs and poised for the strike. Unmoving, muscles tensed. He leaped. He had misjudged the distance. As he landed short, paws flailing, the squeaker had just enough time to give a chirp of terror and then drop, floop, into its hole. Standing over the escape route, Freddy bit his own foot with embarrassment. As Tail Chaser licked the last scraps from the bowl, Thinbone bounded onto the porch. Thinbone was a wild tabby, gray and yellow patchwork, who lived in a culvert across the field. He was a little older than Fritty and made much of it. Very foul, Tail Chaser. Thinbone leaned over and sharpened his claws lazily on a wooden pillar. Looks like you're being fed well tonight. Tell me, do the big ones make you do tricks for your supper? I've often wondered how it worked, you understand. Freddy pretended to ignore him and began cleaning his whiskers. I notice, Thinbone continued, that the growlers seem to have some sort of arrangement. They carry things for the big ones and leap around a great deal and bark all night for their dinner. Is that what you do? Thinbone stretched nonchalantly. I'm just curious, you understand. Some night, 
Oh, I admit it's not likely, but some night I might be unable to catch dinner, and it would be nice to have something to fall back on. Is barking very difficult? Be quiet, Thin Bone, Pretty snarled, then gave a sneeze of laughter and leaped on his friend. They wrestled for a moment, then broke apart, batting at each other with their paws. Finally, tired out, they sat for a moment, reordering their fur. The hour of deepest quiet was just starting, and Mirslar's eye was high in the sky above, remote and unblinking. The wind shivered the leaves on the trees as Tailchaser and Thinbone made their way across fields and over fences, pausing to listen to night sounds, then galloping across wet, glimmering lawns. As they came under the eaves of the old woods that flanked the dwellings of the big ones, they could smell the fresh scents of others of their kind. Over the top of the rise and past a stand of massive oak trees lay the entrance to the canyon. Tailchaser thought happily to himself of the songs and stories that would be shared at the crumbling meeting wall. He thought also of Hushpad, whose slim gray form and arching slender tail had been on his mind almost constantly of late. It was fine to be alive and of the folk on meeting night. Mirslar's eye cast a mother-of-pearl light on the clearing. Twenty-five or thirty cats were assembled at the base of the wall, rubbing against each other in greeting, sniffing the nose of a new acquaintance. There was much mock fighting among the younger folk. Tailchaser and Thinbone were greeted by a gang of young hunters who stood casually about on the edge of the throng. Wait, you're here, cried Fleetpaw, a young fellow with thick black and white fur, we're just about to have a game of hop in the air. Uh, until the elders arrive, that is. Thinbone jogged over to join them, but Freddy lowered his head politely and moved toward the crowd to look for Hushpad. He could not locate her scent as he slid through the milling group of cats. A pair of young phalas, barely out of kittenhood, wrinkled their noses at him flirtatiously, then ran away, sneezing merriment. Ignoring them, he bowed his head respectfully as he passed Stretch Slow. The older male, who lay majestically prone at the, base of the, at the base of the wall, dignified him with a lazy blink of his huge green eyes and a desultory ear wiggle. Still no hush pad, thought Freddy. Where can she be? Nobody missed a meeting night if he could help it. Meetings were only on those nights when the eye was completely open and at its brightest. Perhaps she'll come later, he thought. Or perhaps even now she was walking with jump tall or leaf rustle, extending her tail languidly for them to admire. The thought made him angry. He turned and cuffed a juvenile Tom who had been prancing and capering at his heels. It was young Pouncequick who gave him such a look of dismay that Freddy immediately felt sorry he had done it. The rambunctious kitten was often a nuisance, but well mean. Ah, I'm sorry, Pounce Quick, he said. I didn't know it was you. I, I thought it was old Stretch Slow, and I was going to teach him a lesson. Really? gasped the young one. You would have done that to him? Freddy, re Freddy regretted his joke. Stretch Slow would not find it very funny. Well, anyway, he said, it was a mistake, and I apologize. Pounce Quick was charmed at being treated as an adult. I certainly will accept your apology, Tail Chaser, he said gravely. It was an understandable mistake. Freddy snorted. Giving the young cat a playful, gentle bite on the flank, he continued on his way. Halfway through deepest quiet, the meeting was well underway, and Hushpad had still not made an appearance. While one of the elders regaled the assembled multitude, now swollen to almost sixty. Tailchaser sought Thinbone, who was sitting with Fleetpaw and the others. The elder was describing a large and potentially dangerous growler who was running wild in the area, and Thinbone and the other hunters were listening intently as Freddy approached. Thinbone, he hissed, will you come over and talk to me for a moment? Thinbone yawned and stretched before ambling over to Freddy's tree root perch. Ah, uh, what is it then? he inquired amiably. Is it time for my barking lessons? 
please, Thinbone, no games. I can't find Hushpad anywhere. Do you know where she is? Thinbone considered Tail Chaser as the elder droned on. So, he said, I, I thought you seemed a little preoccupied. All this over a fela? We were doing the dance of acceptance last night, said Freddy, stung. We didn't have a chance to finish before the sun came up. We were going to finish tonight. I know she was going to accept me. What, what, what could have made her miss the meeting? Thinbone lowered his ears in mock, in mock terror. An interrupted dance of acceptance. <gasps> Sky dancers, whiskers, I, I think I see your fur falling out already. And your tail is going limp. Frick, Freddy shook his head impatiently. I know you think it's funny, Thinbone, and with your string of tail-waving females, you don't care about a real joining, but, but I do, and I'm worried about Hushpad. Please help me. Thinbone looked at him for a moment, blinking his eyes and scratching behind his, behind his right ear. All right, Tail Chaser, he said simply. What can I do? Well, I suppose there's not much we can do tonight, but... If I can't find her tomorrow, could you perhaps come out and have a look around with me? I suppose so, replied Thinbone, but I think that a little patience will probably... Ow! Fleetpaw had come up from below and butted his flat head against Thinbone's haunches. Come now, Fleetpaw cried. What is all this deep discussion? Bristlejaw is going to tell a story, and here you sit like two fat eunuchs. Tailchaser and Thinbone bounced down after their friend. Phalas were phalas, but a story was nothing to sniff at. The folk squeezed closer around the meeting wall, an ocean of waving tails. Slowly and with immense dignity, Bristlejaw mounted a crumbled section of the wall. At the highest point, he paused and waited. Having seen some eleven or twelve summers, Bristlejaw was certainly no longer a young cat, but iron control was in all his movements. His fur, once brilliant with patches of rust and black, had dulled somewhat with age, and the stiff fur jutting from around his muzzle had gone gray-white. His eyes were bright and clear, though, and could bring a sporting kitten to a halt from three jumps away. Bristlejaw was an oil sirva, a master old singer, one of the keepers of the lore of the folk. All the history of the folk was in their songs, passed on in the higher singing of the elder days from one generation to another as a sacred trust. Bristlejaw was the only old singer within some distance of the meeting wall, and his stories were as important to his folk as water or the freedom to run and jump as they pleased. From his position atop the wall, he surveyed the cats below for a long time. The expectant murmurings quieted to soft purring. Some of the young cats, tremendously excited and, and unable to sit still, began frantically grooming themselves. Bristlejaw flicked his tail three times, and there was silence. We thank our elders who watch over us, he began. We praise Mirsla, whose eye lights our hunting. We salute our quarry for making the chase sweet. Thanks. Praise, salutations. We are the folk, and tonight we speak in one voice of the deeds of all. We are the folk. Caught up in the ancient ritual, the cat swayed gently from side to side. Bristlejaw began his story. In the days of the Earth's youth, when some of the first were still seen in these fields, Queen Satinir, granddaughter of Fela Skydancer, ruled in the court of Harar. And she was a good queen. Her paw was as just in aid of her folk as her claw was swift to harm for her enemies. Her son and co-regent was Prince Ninebirds. He was a huge cat, mighty in battle, swift to anger and swollen in pride for all his youthful years. At his naming, the story had been told of how, as a kitten, he had slain a branch full of starlings with one blow of his claws. So, Ninebirds 
he was named, and the fame of his strength and his deeds stretched far. It had been many, many summers since the death of White Wind, and none living in the court at this time had ever seen any of the first. Firefoot had been wandering in the wild for generations, and many thought him dead, or gone to join his father and grandmother in the sky. As stories of nine birds' strength and bravery began to run from mouth to ear among the folk, and as nine birds began to listen to those ignoble ones who always cling to the great folk, he began to see in himself the greatness of the firstborn. One day it was told throughout the world forest that nine birds was no longer content to be prince regent at his mother's side. A meeting was declared to which all the folk were to come from far and wide for feasting, hunting, and games. And at this meeting, he would assume the mantle of Harar, which Tangalur Firefoot had declared sacrosanct, but for the firstborn. And nine, bar nine birds would declare himself king of cats. And so came the day, and all the folk gathered at the court. While all cavorted and danced and sang, nine birds sunned his great body and looked on. Then he stood and spoke, I, nine birds, by right of blood and claw, stand before you today to assume the mantle of kingship, which has gone long unfilled. If no cat has any reason why I should not take upon myself this ancient burden. At that very moment, there was a noise in the crowd, and a very old cat stood up. His fur was shot all over with gray especially about his legs and paws, and his muzzle was snow white. You assume the mantle by right of blood and claw, Prince Nine Birds? questioned the old cat. I do, answered the great prince. By what right of blood do you claim the kingship? queried the old white whisker. By the blood of Fela Sky Dancer that runs in me, you toothless old squeaker friend rejoined nine birds hotly and rose from where he lay. All the gathered folk whispered excitedly as nine birds walked to the vakazme, the tree root seat sacred to the firstborn. Before all the assembled folk, nine birds lifted his long tail and sprayed the vakazme with his hunt mark. There was more excited whispering and the old cat tottered forward. Oh, prince who would be king of cats, said the ancient one. Perhaps by blood you have some claim, but what of claw? Will you fight in single combat for the mantle? Of course, said nine birds, laughing. And who will oppose me? The crowd goggled, looking about for some mighty challenger who would fight with the massive prince. I will said the old one simply. All the folk hissed in surprise and arched their backs, but nine birds only laughed again. Go home, old fellow, and wrestle with beetles, said he. I will not fight with you. The king of cats can be no coward, said the old cat. At that nine birds cried in anger and leaped forward, swinging his huge paw at the old gray muzzle. But with surprising speed, the old one leaped aside and dealt a buffet to the prince's head that addled his wits for a moment. They began to fight in earnest, and the multitude could scarcely credit the speed and courage of the old cat, who opposed such a great and fierce fighter. After a long while, they closed and wrestled together, and although the prince bit at his neck, the old one brought up his hind claws and scratched, and nine birds' fur was scattered in the air. When they broke apart, nine birds was full of surprise that this lean elder could do him such harm. You have lost much of your pelt, O oh prince, said the old one. Will you renounce your claim? Anger at the prince charged, and they fell again to fighting. The old one caught the prince's tail between his teeth. And when the prince tried to turn and rend his face, the elder pulled his tail from his body. The folk hissed with astonishment and fear as nine birds wheeled bloodily around 
and faced the old cat once more who was himself wounded and panting. You have lost your fur and tail, O prince. Will you not also yield your claim? Maddened by pain, Ninebergs flung himself on the ancient one, and they wrestled, spitting and swiping blood and tears glistening in the sun. At last the challenger wedged Prince Ninebird's hindquarters beneath a root of the vacasme. As the dirt settled, an excited shock ran through those watching. In the last battling, quantities of white dust had been knocked free from the coat of the challenger. His muzzle was no longer gray, and his paws and legs shone the color of flame. You see me revered, you see me revealed, nine birds, he said. I am Lord Tangalur Firefoot, son of Harar, and it is by my command that there is no king of cats. You are a brave cat, O oh Prince, he continued, but your insolence may not go unpunished. With that, Firefoot caught the scruff of the prince's neck and pulled, stretching his body and legs until they were thrice as long as a cat's are meant to be. He then pulled the prince loose from the tree root and said, tailless and hairless, long and ungainly have I made you. Go now and come never more to the court of Harar, you who would have usurped his power. But this doom I lay on you, that you shall serve any member of the folk who commands you, and so shall all of your descendants until I release your line from this bane. And with that, Lord Tangalur went away. The folk drove the misformed nine birds from their mist, calling him man, meaning out of the sunshine. And he and all his descendants went ever after on their hind legs, and do today, for man's forelegs have been stretched too far away to touch the ground. Nine birds, the usurper, punished by the firstborn, was the first of the big ones. They have long served the folk, making us shelter from the rain and feeding us when the hunt is bad. And if some of us now serve the disgraced man, that is another story for another meeting. We are the folk, and tonight we speak in one voice of the deeds of all. We are the folk. His song finished, Bristlejaw leaped down from the wall with a strength belying his many summers. All the assembled folk respectfully bowed their heads down between their forepaws as he left. The hour of final dancing was drawing to a close and the meeting broke up into small groups. The, the cats saying their farewells, discussing the song and gossiping. Tail Chaser and Thinbone hung on for a while, discussing plans for the next evening with Fleetpaw and some of the other young hunters then took their leave. As they went, frisked back across the fields, they stumbled on a mole stranded away from its burrow. After they chased it a bit, Thinbone broke its neck and they ate. Bellies full, they parted at Friggy's porch. Murray Fowl, tail chaser, said Thinbone, if you need my help tomorrow, I'll be in Edge Cops at unfolding dark. Good dreaming to you also, Thinbone. You are a good friend. Thinbone, gave a flick of his tail and was gone. Fritty hopped into the box left for him by the big ones and sank into the sleep world. Ooh, look at the timing. So that's the end of the introduction. The introduction, <laughs> two introductions. The introduction, the introduction in chapter one. So if current plans go as I intend them to go, I will tomorrow, 7 p.m. or today, 7 p.m. my time, Pacific Daylight Time, I will read chapter two. Again, I hasten to say, as far as I know, these are being put on YouTube and they're also available on my Facebook page, probably on my Twitter page, 
and um, I don't know of any, re and, and also the my author page on Facebook. So there's actually three sources plus YouTube if you want to hear the next section without having to actually be present for it. Although I know it's just not the same as getting to see my bright, shining, youthful face and all of that stuff and hear my dulcet tones. But that option at least is available if you don't want to be back here in nine, 16 hours. Um, but I will be reading then and we will read more of Tell Chaser. And so depending on how many chapters I get, I will be reading either chapter three or chapter four, probably next week at this same time slot. So with that said, thank you for joining me on this little trip back down memory lane. I had forgotten how much of the story was in that introduction. Um, and uh, I also literally, I haven't, I, I think I read part of the book again before I wrote the introduction and I read another part of it when we were trying to work on a possible film project. Um, but other than that, I have not read the book uh, in a long, long time. So I'm going to find out as much about it as you will if you haven't read it before practically. Um, and I'm also going to be just making stuff up as I go because who has time to, you know, plan the readings out ahead of time and work up different voices and all that stuff. So we're, we're just, I, I don't know what we're doing here. I was going to use a term that I suddenly decided was actually not probably an appropriate all ages kind of a term, but we're just freewheeling. How's that? We're freewheeling here in terms of me and cats and reading and doing voices and stuff. So anyway, with that, I want to thank all of you, as always, for coming to join me. It's a great pleasure. Stay well, stay healthy, take care of the people around you, even those that you don't know all that well, because there are somebody's loved ones. And I thank you for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you again very soon, one way or the other. And have a lovely day or